Let's hear it for Ryan Bernizer. Okay, thank you guys so much for coming. Thanks everyone for watching as well. Uh, my name is Ryan. I apologize. Uh, I'm not just a white male. As a Ryan Kelly Brenizer, I'm extra white. As an Irishman, I'm kind of like the color of loose leaf paper. Um, but I am so excited to be here. I'm so excited uh, you know, to, to be a part of it. I've, I've been involved with B&H mostly since you know, years going back where I would just geek out and walk around the stores and watch how the film would track around the ceiling. And so it's very, very exciting to be here. So some of you guys may know me from my photography work. Um, probably less of you know me from my dance career. Um, but what I want to talk today mostly about is the business side. Uh, there's so many things that we can get through in a 15-year you know, career to carve it down into an hour and 15 minutes. Um, but there's a lot of things that I do uniquely in business that I think can be helpful to people at every stage, from people who are just starting out, to people who have done this even twice as long as I have. Um, so the important thing about this is when I first thought about giving a business lecture, I was like, how can I give a business lecture? I am an idiot about business. Um, and I said, well, wait a second. I think a lot of photographers are idiots about business, and maybe it's more important to learn how can you be successful when you're an idiot anyway? Um, so that's what this is about. But first, I know some of you people know who I am. Uh, and some of you, this is a hotel, maybe a free event. Some of you maybe wandered off the street, uh, you know, are just looking for the coffee. So I want to tell you a little bit uh, about who I am. So I'm a photographer. I take photos. I've shot the king of the world. I leave with Muhammad Ali because when we talk about the presidents, when we, when we talk about you know, these other people, these less important people, I always say, ah, oh, you know, this dates me, but I go back to Clinton, I've shot Bush, I've, you know, I've photographed Obama twice. Uh, this actually was the, the only moment in history where Romney and Obama were nice to each other. And it was literally a moment. It was just enough for a, a, a shutter to happen, and then they sort of like went back to their own uh, respective corners. But you know, I tell people this, and, they're, and they're, they always say, whoa, whoa, whoa. You shot Muhammad Ali? <laughs> like, so it shows just the way that you live a life uh, can have so much effect reverberating through the world. And, and I keep coming back to this shot because I know that when I took this shot, and of course Muhammad Ali has been through so much and is so racked by, by disease and, and you know, just getting hit in the head for a living, um, but when he looks at you like this, you see he is still there, he still has it, and I know that I have the same expression as that little boy in the corner. Uh, so I will always be grateful just to be in these situations and around some of these people. And I've seen some crazy stuff along the way. I don't want to get into my photojournalism career. Here's just uh, a little sample. This was the World Trade Center after Osama bin Laden was killed. And I just went out and said, I'm going to do this on my own, because I know it's going to be an important event. I also know that it's happening at night. And I know that I've trained for many, many years at capturing things in the darkness and terribleness of New York City wedding halls. So maybe there's something that I can add to this conversation. And it got picked up and, and brought around. So I've been to a lot of interesting places. I've met a lot of interesting people. But in my time, nothing compares to weddings. People say, like, you've shot three presidents. You've done this. Like, why do you do weddings? Is there something that is an accident? Um, and absolutely not. I have now done just about somewhere in the vicinity of 400 weddings. And I love it more now than when I did my first, or my fourth, or my 40th. And the important thing about me is not that I've done 400 weddings, but that I, I hope that I can do 4,000 more. And so how do, we how do we have that, keep that creative vision, how do we have that energy and keep it going? And that's really what this is about. But I want to show you a little bit more of why I love weddings. Weddings are beautiful. We know that. I mean, that's kind of the point of them. People put in a lot of effort into making it beautiful. They're beautiful in so many different ways. Weddings are crazy, right? We can focus, as photographers, we can focus just on the beauty, right? But as people, as people who know people who've been to weddings, 
we think a lot about just how crazy they are and how crazy we are when we're at them. So these are stories that I want to tell too. Weddings are weird. I will always show this photo, specifically because this was shown online as one of the worst engagement photos of all time. And so I'm extra proud of it, because I love this photo, actually. And, and so I'm just going to say, you know what, if I ever book a wedding because of this, then I will, I will uh, you know, stuff the tribe or whatever they are right in the face. So weddings are joyful, right? Weddings are fleeting. Weddings are about moments. Uh, some of you may know I actually uh, co-founded a blog called Moment Junkie, which is now under new, new management, which is great because I don't have the time to run a blog, and so now it's much better. Um, but they, you know, I love the, the moments in life that define who we are. And that's the key to so much of photography. Photography is about taking a complicated three-dimensional, you know, four-dimensional world where we're also moving through time, putting it in this flat space, and somehow saying, I can derive all of this meaning from this single moment, if it's the right moment. Weddings are iconic. Most of the things that we think about in weddings come to us from imagery, from tradition, from ritual. Most of the ways that we shoot, most of the ways that we recognize what is a good picture or not, comes to these things that have been handed down from all of the millions of pictures we've ever seen before, or that our clients have seen before, that says to yourself, oh, here, right in front of me, is a good picture. Whether it's Clark Gable or you know, some ad you see on the subway. Weddings are emotional. You know, it's fun for me that I spend a lot of time around crying people, <laughs> and that sometimes I make people cry for a living. And I love that. I don't know what that says about me. Weddings are about our connections to each other in so many different ways. Weddings are about symbols. Some of the things that we capture are rituals that go back thousands and thousands of years, especially the wedding ring is one of the oldest. Some of the things aren't as old as you think, white wedding dresses and, and all that. But the heart of it, the heart of the ritual, goes back farther than we can possibly imagine. And these symbols, again, define our connections. I, I always somehow end up, whenever I shoot expatriate couples, somehow American flags get in the photos. I don't know what I'm saying about that. But, but they chose the location, so they're here for a reason. And weddings are about more than that. Weddings are about the transcendent. Weddings are about more than just a bunch of people in a room. They're doing something that is so deep and so emotional you know, and sometimes, you know, and religious and, and personal, and there's so many levels to it. Weddings are about sensation, right? A good photo, sometimes you don't just see it, sometimes you can hear it. Maybe sometimes you can smell a good photo, maybe you can taste it, you know, if you like to taste the world around you. Weddings are glamorous, you know, especially in New York. Here, you know, here we are, we're in Manhattan, we're in a very glamorous room, and there's been some glamorous weddings right here. You know, also some bar mitzvahs, I'm sure, but, um, and somehow I'm here now. But weddings are about glamour in their own way. People certainly try for that. But weddings are also hilarious. Right? Weddings, in the end, is that you might be seeing what I'm getting at. Weddings are not one simple story. There's something like three million people getting married every year. They're not all having one wedding. They're all having something that's a reflection of themselves. Even if they all got married here, in this room, with the same caterer, the same everything, it's going to be different because they're different. And that's what I love about storytelling. That's why I can do 400 weddings and love it more than my fourth. Because, sure, I see a lot of white dresses. I see a lot of rings. But every day is fresh and new because Sometimes I deal with people like this. My favorite thing about this photo, by the way, is that this beer, right up there, never spilled. <laughs> so sometimes there are miracles in wedding days as well. But in the end, even, you know, wedding photography can be something important even for people that don't necessarily like weddings, because weddings make our families. And weddings define our families. 
not just the families that we have, but the families that we choose for ourselves, the friends that we celebrate with, and sometimes the families that we are making. This, this was such a touching moment for me. You know, this is a, a 12-year-old boy, which is just like one of the most insecure class of people that can possibly exist. I remember when I was 12 years old, to emote in public when you want to be cool more than anything. And he gets up and he gives a speech to welcome his new mother. And he just breaks down crying because he's so happy. And that, to me, is a beautiful moment that I am, I am more honored to be a part of that than you know, to be around the president. So the thing about me is I take a lot of photos. In the past five years, on average, the whole year, including the off-season, I've been shooting a wedding every three and a half days. So that average is about 65 weddings a year. For the math challenge, that's the same as shooting every Saturday and Sunday, all year, every week, for five years. So I get two questions when I, I tell people this. And the first is, like, how do I do this? How do you get that many weddings? And the second is, why do I do this? Why people, you know, the first time I'm like, oh yeah, I do 65, 70 weddings a year. And they're like, well, that was a mistake. You're gonna fix that. And you know, now I've done it for, for about, I'm running on my sixth year. And so I wanna explain both of these to you. It's not easy. But in my mind, I prefer hard to boring. And that's a little bit of, of the artistic personality, the, part, the kind of crazy personality that you need to be a wedding photographer in, in the first place. And to choose this over a life of just you know, pressing the same button over and over and over again. So at its base level, I want to talk a little bit about where I come from. That whenever people say, like, how oh, you do 70 weddings a year? That's amazing, how do you do that? Well, here's where I come from. This is the first of my two major male role models in my life. This is my grandfather. And I'm a, I'll tell the story shortly, but basically, he was a, he put his brother through school by coal mining before he ever got to the stage of raising five children and working three jobs. And then when he had a heart attack, they said, well, hold on back there. Maybe you should just work two jobs, <laughs> right? So whenever I think, when people say, like, you go to a party 65 times a year, that's crazy. <laughs> I think about my grandfather in the coal mine. Wedding photography is hard. There are things that are harder. But, you know, people say, okay, wedding photography is not just going to a party 65 times a year. There's so much more that goes into it. Well, says who? Is that necessarily so? To some extent, but not entirely. And let me show you where I'm coming from, because all of these problems that you're having, I've had. <laughs> I've been through them, and more. And all of the solutions that I've come up with, I had to struggle to get to. Again, I'm an idiot. None of this was natural for me. So I want to tell you about two Novembers. The first, November 2009. I did 65 weddings that year. And this is a wedding at the end. And the wedding was wonderful. This, this couple is wonderful. This, this you know, photo, everything, great day. But I am so stressed inside my skin that on the way home from the wedding, Driving home, a car kind of pulled out in front of me. And just that, it got me so stressed that I punched out the windshield of the car that I was driving. Because all the stuff that you feel sometimes, all the stuff of like late nights and stress, and, and this was me, because I'm doing 65 weddings a year. So, two years in the future, another November. I am now so happy, so comfortable in my skin, so comfortable in my business, so comfortable with the flow of everything. Everything is working, everything is going well, not just in the photos, but in my life. Well, how many weddings did I do that year? 71. They went up six. 
So something else changed. A lot of things changed. But we're going to cover the major ones. So this lecture is not about how to take photos. You've had a lot of great ones. There's a lot of great places to find that. You just, you just had a great one right before me. This is about something that's a little bit harder, which is how to not stop. And this is something that's important to us at every stage along the spectrum, from whether you haven't shot your first wedding yet to whether you've shot a 1,000. And so here's a, a quick quote, uh, quote from Calvin Coolidge. I think this is the most he's ever said at one time. A um, little history joke for the 1920s fans there. Um, <laughs> Nothing in the world can take place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. Do we know any really talented photographers that aren't doing so well? Go to any art school if you're not thinking about yourself. Um, something like 98% of people with photography degrees don't end up becoming professional photographers. This is truer today and in this field than ever. Endurance is what matters. Persistence is what matters. Keeping going when the person next to you won't is what matters. How, and how do we get there? And that's what this is about. The good thing is that persistence in learning photography, persistence in taking photos, that's great. That's fun. That's why we got into this in the first place. because. Photography is really, really fun. It's a hobby. People love it. We do a hobby for a job. So learning to be better at photos, learning to just see in new ways, getting a new lens, getting pieces of equipment, this is all fun. It's all the other stuff that starts to drive people down, because maybe we didn't expect it. Maybe we didn't expect how much of it there is. So all this stuff can sometimes you know, eat at us and say, like, wait, weren't we here to take photos? When did that part happen? So this is the number one thing that changed in between my two Novembers, which is that I delegate everything that started to drag me down. And if you guys, as you start to work, as you're in your process, and you find the things that just all of a sudden you hitch on, the things that you procrastinate on, the things that you say, oh, oh God, I have to do this now, you need to get rid of that and have somebody else do it. Because we're freelancers. We run a business. If we can do more of the stuff that we most enjoy, that is probably also the stuff that is most profitable, or will be when you become really good at it because you do it a lot. So the thing is, I delegate everything. So like, I, you know, I don't clean my apartment. I delegate that. I don't do my laundry. I delegate that. Because that's time that can be spent in better areas. So, and, and we'll talk about all the business delegation I do, but I mean everything. Because we can work more. I could take that four hours that I could have been spent you know, cleaning my apartment and I could do something very profitable with that. Or something that's very fun that allows me to do something very profitable later. So a lot of people when they get in the stage, and <laughs> sorry B and H, but they only think about the money that they can spend on gear, right? I have a friend who you know, just bought a camera set up for $17,000. And then the next day, he's complaining about all the email he has to do. And I said, you realize, for that $17,000, you would never have had to do email this year. So think also about how we can get help, how we could pay for that, how we can work, how we, we can network, because these are the things that will carry you through. So some of you may have seen this chart before. It's, it's not from me. Um, this is the perception and reality of what wedding photographers do. We think this big red thing is taking pictures, and sometimes you travel to exotic locations, sometimes you party like a rock star. This, from actual survey data, is what we find that we really do. Mostly editing, some bookkeeping, album production. That little red slice is still taking pictures, the thing that we wanted to do in the first place. That's how life is. So I say, can I undo this? This is my life on the left. I spent at least half my working time actually taking photos. I still spend some time editing and publishing photos. I, am, I, just, I have to get in there. I have to do it. 
Um, workshops, travel, paperwork, sometimes a party like a rock star, but oh, very little. Um, and this is what I want to do. Ideally, I want to be an associate shooter for my own studio. I want to just be an employee of myself and do nothing but shoot, meet with clients, because that's what I love, that's what I'm good at, that's what I'm most profitable for, and you know, I've spent 15% meeting clients, meeting other photographers, doing this, and maybe 5% video games. Why not? So those are my goals. This is the way that I structure my business, and it's obviously it's worked very well for me, because when you do the math, like, I'm not cheap anymore, and I do 70 weddings a year. I do okay. So I wanted to see, is this right for you? Does this model work for people? That's the thing. So this doesn't sound so bad, right? When you first hear, oh, 70 weddings, huh? Oh, wait. If I do more weddings, maybe I can have more people do the stuff that I don't like. Maybe I don't like album design. Maybe I, I really drag down um, just on you know, interacting with, with clients, with yeah, emails taking me down. So this isn't such a bad life, right? While you're doing this, I'm shooting weddings. I'm here. And by the way, here's a first tip. Uh, email is much easier to do with your fingers. I'm not sure. Stock photography is a little crazy sometimes. So does this model work for you? Well, there's some advantages to it, and we talked about some of them. But the main thing is that I shoot a lot. So as they've said, I come out and I haven't been in the field as long as some of the other people here, but I've done 400 weddings very fast. And what that gives me is not just expertise in photography, because I had that for 10 years before I shot my first wedding. But now I have an expertise in weddings. Again, like every three and a half days, I'm at a wedding. When I go to a wedding, I feel like I'm home. Right? This is just like, are you nervous? Like, I'm just, no, I'm home, man. This is a place I go every three and a half days. And there are certain things that you only learn at weddings, no matter how much other photography you've done. For example, if anyone here has shot Catholic weddings, you know there's like a 45-minute window where the first kiss could happen at any time. Right? Sometimes it's like right at the end or after or not at all. Or sometimes it's like they just will like, they're trying to mess with me, I swear. They'll like whisper to the couple, like, yes, don't tell the photographer. <laughs> right? And I always get that shot. I always get it because I know the flow. I know the rhythm of weddings. When I did my first wedding, I felt like a lot of you guys did when you did your first wedding. I went, like, I went to work the next day, and I was like, I'm going to die. <laughs> that was the most stressful, like, most just on my body, because you spend the whole time, wait, put a, where, where, here, what? Now, like, I can shoot an entire wedding and, you know, go out afterward. I, you know, like, I want to go dancing. I've been around dancing for a long time because I, even, I work even harder than I ever did, but I know the direction where I'm supposed to go because I've developed an expertise in weddings. You also develop a very large referral base very quickly when you shoot a lot. So New York is a giant market, giant, like the biggest. But I get people who come in and, and they say, well, I guess I have to hire you because you've shot three of my cousin's weddings and two of my coworkers' weddings <laughs> in, a, in a referral in a place the size of New York. Right, because you're shooting a lot. You're shooting a lot for you know, a certain kind of clientele. And it just it, it gives you something, a lot more stability just through that. Because there are so many people out there who I have shot for, and they have wedding parties, and they have friends, and they have coworkers, people who are going to be getting married next. And then the reason I really did it in the first place is because I'm a natural pessimist. And of course, you know, especially because my wedding photography business really started taking off in 2008, which was a good time to be a pessimist. And I said, if I shoot a lot, because I know, as a pessimist, I know everyone, everyone here, including myself, everyone is going to have lean years. Everyone's going to have years that are slower than others. If you shoot 15 weddings a year, your lean year is five. And that's bad. If I shoot 70 weddings a year, my lean year is 55. I can still live. I mean, it's 15 weddings less than, than maybe the other year, but it actually doesn't affect that much. Right? You become more stable. It's more like, oh, I can, this is like I can actually depend on it, which is good because when I came from a paycheck job 
to this job. And as a pessimist, all I could start thinking was like, huh, if I tear my Achilles, you know, there goes my entire life. Um, you know, you know, I want to plan for all of these things. So this makes me a little bit more stable, and also I build up a little bit more savings. Who here has a good, as a photographer, full-time photographer, has a good savings plan, retirement plan? Excellent. We've got about 5% of the audience here, which is way higher than most audiences. Um, I work so hard, I have a great retirement plan um, because I work for that. Because I know that lean years are going to happen. And, of course, the main advantage is you get to do the fun stuff. I say to myself, if I do this wedding, I don't have to clean my apartment this year. Or, you know, three months, or you know, whatever the, the transfer rate is. Um, if I do this wedding, if I book one more, I save all that time, I don't you know, have to do this much email. I don't have to design this many albums. So the very first thing that I uh, delegated was email. And we'll talk about that in a second. Now, of course, there are disadvantages. And this is why most people don't do this. And the main one, when you ask, wait a second, how do you book 70 weddings a year? There's only one answer in the end, charge less. Charge less than you should. And which is why it's not the best answer for, for everyone, because to book 70 weddings a year, you, it really takes a lot of time to fill in those last dates, so you're probably turning away hundreds. And that means my entire career, I charge less than I should. But, and no one tells you this. Everyone's like, always charge more, always charge more, because we know, we've seen so many people start out and not realize you know, how little money they're actually making. You say, wow, $1,000. I'm making $1,000. And then you learn taxes and self-employment fees and, and labor and all this stuff. No, you're not. Um, so we want to guard against that. But if you really want momentum and you really know the amount of money you're actually making from a wedding and you can make that choice intelligently, this is how you build momentum as a photographer. This is how you practice. This is how you become an expert, not just in photography, but also at weddings. And of course, it's still really, really hard. Really hard. Window punching hard, if you don't do it right. So how do we do the really hard stuff? Because this is where it can be, the, you know, I, I want to have an advantage. I don't want everyone to work like me. I don't want everyone to charge less and do 70 weddings. But the answer is, if I, if I can do 70 weddings, like you wouldn't imagine, like, like 35 weddings would be a vacation for me. So if we can learn these habits, it can feel a little bit more like a vacation for you too. The real question is, how do we do all this stuff and stay happy? Because endurance, like we don't want, like you can have endurance just from like somebody, you know, just like whipping you, saying you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. But like, we're not out here for misery. We're not out here saying, like, I really want my life to be drudgery. You know, if you were going to do that, you'd stay in the office job and not think about becoming an artist. Artists tend to make less money, but maybe we make it back in happiness. So if you're not happy, you might want to change some things. The answer is, you don't have to run faster than the bear to get away. You just have to run faster than the guy next to you. I saw Joe talking about this a lot, um, which is being the best is a really kind of an, it's an amorphous concept, right? It's about being different. It's about standing out in the market. It's about giving people a reason to hire you that is different than you are cheaper than the person sitting next to you. And that is just about different because best I started out, I was like, I want to be the best. And then I realized, I don't even know what that means. Who is the, you can probably answer the question, who's your favorite musician? But like, who's the best musician? That's, a, that's just a weird question. And the same thing happens in photography. You don't necessarily want to be the best because it's, at some level, it's kind of meaningless. What you want is to connect with your target client the same way that your favorite musician connects with you, when you're just like, they're speaking to me, right? We want our photos to speak 
to the right kind of person, the kind of person that we want to work with. And so here's the thing that I learned. This is a little secret between you, me, and 5,000 others. Competing against other photographers as photographers is really hard. Because, I mean, how many people here, I'll, I'll answer the, uh, the easy one. How many people here started in photography because you're like, I'm really good at business. I love business. I'd like to have a business in something. Why not photography? And then how many people here said, I really like photography. I'd love to make some money at it. A few more, but usually about like 99.5% are in the latter category. So what you have when you're competing against photographers is you're competing against a bunch of other artists. So it's okay that I'm an idiot, because yeah, so is my competition. We're all artists, we're all idiots, in the business way. So I learned, like, okay, I'm going to be better as a photographer and keep getting better because I like that, because that's the fun part. But if I can learn to be better at the, at the business stuff, or at least learn to have my business work better, then that's going to really push me ahead. Because I've learned from hearing about comments about other photographers, they're having the same problems as I am. So what don't photographers do? And I learned that first from myself. What did I not do? And I talked to others. We tend not to answer emails promptly. We tend not to manage our own schedules well. We're not so good at giving up control, right? I mean, we're going into a field where we're kind of working for ourselves. It says something about our personalities. Uh, we tend not to wake up early. <laughs> a lot of night owls in the photographer crowd. And we're not really good bosses to ourselves. And we often don't think about the work that we produce from a non-photographer's perspective because we become surrounded by other photographers, largely because we keep the opposite hours from the rest of the world, and we quickly lose contact with anyone who's not a photographer. So we are surrounded by photographers right here, and we think about photos only from a photographer's perspective, whereas for me, one of the most valuable people I had when I was starting as a wedding photographer was there was someone standing over my shoulder who knew nothing about photography, but knew what they liked. Right? knew what other people liked. I mean, how many people have gone out and deliberately found somebody who's not a photographer, but maybe is very similar to the clients that you're trying to sell to, and said, hey, what do you think of this? What do you think of these 100 photos? Which ones do you like? Because they won't talk about the bokeh. They won't talk about, you know, I mean, I really like your lens choice here. Like, oh, what was that, a tilt shift? They'll only talk about how they feel, what that photo makes them feel. And it's important to get beyond that. And these are things that the people sitting next to you probably aren't so good at either. So if you can become good at them, you have a way bigger advantage than just trying to be the best at shooting a camera. Because everyone else is trying that too. So if we learn nothing about business from this entire lecture, people you know, who are in this field, you can make a lot of money just from this slide. If you want more business, answer your email. Promptly answered emails will increase your response rate, will increase your rate of booking so dramatically. And if you know you're not good at answering emails promptly because of your life, because of your habits, get somebody else to do it. Train them. Because here I am, I'm speaking right now, and my emails are getting answered. Are yours? If somebody comes at, calls me right now and wants to book a wedding, they can do that. And I did that, and that was the first thing that I delegated. So now you're saying to yourself, whoa, you've got a pretty good income base to pay other people. I'm doing math in my head. You do 70 weddings a year. I know you're not cheap. That's one thing. I, I don't have that kind of income base. Well, I did this right from the start. It was the first thing I did. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay somebody $15 an hour five hours a week. And five hours, that booked me probably 100 weddings. Because that five hours was the difference between me responding to that email in a timely manner, or me still responding to those emails from early 2009, like right now. Which I'm sure, yeah, we know we have an incredible backlog sometimes. 
So, because you want to think from the perspective of your clients. Like, how does somebody actually book you? How does somebody actually make the decision to give you money? It's very important. Um, and what happens is, you know, we, think, we want it to be like this romantic, amazing moment where they come to our site and they care about nobody else and they go through all their work. But what happens usually is they're at work and they find some kind of list and they open up like 30 people in tabs. They click the, the people they really don't like and they contact lots of people that they do. I mean, I have booked clients who have met with 25 other photographers. God knows how many they emailed. So what happens is they spread out as many emails as they can. They want to get this done. Maybe they send out 50 emails. And guess how many emails they get back promptly? Two <laughs> out of 50, right? So many of our emails that lead to wedding bookings start with, oh my God, thank God you actually responded to me. <laughs> I've been trying to deal with photographers, idiots like me, for a long time. And again, if they were just dealing with me, I'm not good at business, I'm not good you know, at any of this stuff, I'd be worse than any of you. So I said, this is the first thing that I need to do. And I swear to God, 100 weddings, just from that. Most valuable slide you've ever seen. So the end goal of us, really, is to be eudaimonious. What does that mean? It doesn't actually mean anything, because it's, it's kind of a weird parsing of speech. But it's a certain kind of happiness, right? So we want to learn to be better at business. We want to learn to do more. We want to learn to shoot more. But not if it makes us miserable. Our only goal in the end, really, is to be happy. Because we know how our story ends. Like, spoiler alert, you die. I die. So the only thing that matters in the middle is, were we happy? Did our choices lead us to happiness, long-term happiness. I don't mean like, woo, cupcake, all right, makes me happy. Ugh, you know, I had 40 cupcakes, I'm not happy anymore. We want to make good, long-term choices. That's it. That's the main goal. Everything else should lead up to that. Everything else is noise. That is the only goal. So we all think, OK, we've got, I've got everyone who's my client, this, they are my boss. I left this, I left my life of having a boss, and now I have more bosses than ever. But we really only have one boss, the head of the company, if, if you're in a, uh, your, own, your own company, and it's you. And the problem is, that boss is a jerk. Right? First of all, like, they know whenever you're goofing off. Right? And they're usually not kind to you for it, because we are our own worst critics. And now that critic is your boss. So how do we be good bosses to ourselves? And the first and most obvious thing is, like, is we all hear work-life balance, work-life balance. You've got to have work-life balance. It doesn't really work for me. It's a little bit too simple. It's a little bit too pat. Work-life balance is for people who hate their jobs. Because when you say work-life balance, you're setting up something. We have something that's good over here, life, and then something bad, work. And we just want to do some less of this so we can have more of the life stuff. But that's not why we became photographers. It, we, nobody became photographers and said, like, you know what I really hate? Photography. <laughs> Ugh. I'm going to just do it, but I'm going to do as little as possible so I can have this life. We do, photo is, is a hobby. It's something that enriches life. If we can get back to that feeling of it being a hobby, of be, being exciting, it is something that can feel, in large ways, like a vacation, something that can enrich our entire life. I mean, the greatest gift to being a photographer is that you're always taking photos. Training as a photographer, training your eye, means that right now I am taking photos. I'm seeing the world in a different way. I'm seeing depth, I'm seeing color, I'm seeing re reflectivity in a different way than I did 10 years ago. 95% of the best photos I've ever taken were taken by my eyes just for me. And that is a gift for every one of us. So we're not talking about work-life balance, but I want to talk about science. That's right. I'm going to drop some science on you. I've done my research for this lecture. I've even got things. There's a thing called the Easterlin Paradox. You want to get into it? Basically, science, for all their glories, they still can't figure out if money actually makes us happy. 
they maybe don't know that you know, money can buy cake, and cake makes us happy, right? But the answer is, in the end, what they've kind of figured out is we know there are some situations where money can make you happy. If you don't have the medicine you need, and you will die, and you can buy it with money, that will make you happy. But otherwise, like in the middle, like in the upper echelon, it, it's very, very confusing. Like there, there's not this great relationship. But what we know is that money can actually mess us up. There's a book called Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us. And some of you may have seen the videos for it. And what it says, you know, basically, money can make your life better, obviously. But if you're doing this for the money, it will hurt you. Because we are artists. We are doing something that's very cognitive. And this isn't just me. This isn't just me being like a poet. This is science. Doing things for the money or even getting paid more can actually make you worse at your job. If your primary motivator is money, getting more money can make you worse. It's a, it's a fascinating book. It's, you know, they've done these studies. Because any kind of very heavily cognitive, very like heavy mind-driven uh, activity, if you, if you make it about money, if you, make it, if you break it down, you actually just become worse at it for reasons we don't even know why. So the only thing worse than money is the internet fame that we've gotten into. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's dangerous because it kind of feels like money. We tabulate it. We have a number of likes and plus ones, but you can't buy cake with it. You can't buy anything with it. You know, as, as they say in New York, that in 225 will get you on the subway. And we do all of this, and the irony is that photographers aren't famous. There are no rock star photographers. You ask somebody not in this room, out on the street, like, name some famous photographers. This is New York, this is, we're actually in the fashion district or close to it, they might pull out Annie Leibovitz, and then like maybe the person that puts like babies and flowers, right? And that's it. You know, I talked to somebody and they, they said, I wanted to ask my second grade class, you know, all about famous photographers, and the only one they could name was Ashton Kutcher. <laughs> photographers are not rock stars. So this is somebody I'd work with, Jen Selter, I mean, you're a great girl. But she's basically like, she takes photos of herself in yoga pants. And she has more followers than all the photographers you've ever heard of put together. Because she takes photos of herself in yoga pants on a cell phone. And she's got, I think, like 3 million Instagram followers now. And like NFL deals and things like that. And so, just think about that. All the people that you admire, all the art, all, everything you've seen, she's more famous. She's, she gets more likes on her photos. So if you're doing this for likes, she will always have more than you for cell phone photos. This is not the thing that should drive us forward. Because it, it's more dangerous than that as an artist. Because as you know, like when, has anyone here ever had gotten like a lot of likes for a photo that they didn't like? Right? And you're like, really? This? Now I gotta keep doing this? This is what people want? You need to be true to yourself. Because after all, like if you want to be really famous, just make a great sex tape. Later we can talk about the sex tape breakout sessions. It's, <laughs> that's in the side room. That's what it's for. So if money actually is, not, is actually harmful to us, scientifically, at these kind of, kind of things, what really drives us? A lot of the things that made us say, like, I want to leave you know, a paycheck job and become a photographer on my own in the first place. Autonomy, mastery, connection, purpose. And again, this is all science, it's not just me. These are the things that drive us forward. These are the things that make us better. These are the things that, when it gets hard, allow us to take that next step and become more successful. So, first of all, what is autonomy? Autonomy is just that, that feeling of freedom. It's why we leave you know, the, the thumb of our bosses and, you know, and step out from here and say, like, I need to make this on my own. If I work harder, if I do things better, my life will be better. And actually, if I don't work as hard, my life will be worse. And in some way, that's freeing too. 
when I came into the, to an office job for the first time, I was coming from newspapers, which is like, go, 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 or at least was before they're all gone now. Uh, remember newspapers? They were great. That's where I came from. And I went to academia, and I worked in an office there. And I came in, and you know, first of all, uh, they gave me an assignment, and I did it in newspaper speed. I said, here's your first assignment. And I said, 15 minutes later, I said, here it is. And they said, that was your assignment for this week. This is the academia speed. And so I worked really hard, and I got my first performance evaluation, and it was like off the charts. And I was like, wow, performance evaluation. How much more money do I get? And they're like, that's not how it works. <laughs> you get none. You get a good performance evaluation. So we chase after autonomy. That's what makes us do the crazy thing of working for ourselves and not getting a paycheck anymore, because there's something to it. There's something that says, I'm in charge of my own destiny. So the problem is, sometimes it's really hard to be in charge of your own destiny. So I always try to push these envelopes and say, you know, how can I take this and build it for myself? And what I want to do is find the things, find the work, find the things that's most profitable, things that I enjoy most, and again, learn what I'm really terrible at. And be honest with myself. And again, the first way to realize you're terrible at something is if it's on your to-do list and it just stays on your to-do list. And other things jump in front of it and you keep procrastinating on it because you hate it, even if you don't want to admit it to yourself. Know what you suck at. I, for me, what keeps me here, what makes me autonomous, I love the new and unknown. I figure out what are the things that I don't normally do and that's exactly what I want to do. So if I don't normally show student, I am normally out in the world, I normally like variety, and the last place I would ever be is in front of White Seamless. So I say to myself, okay, let's figure out how to shoot White Seamless. Sometimes I say, okay, I always shoot getting ready, wide open, f1.4, I love the backgrounds, I love just getting rid of clutter. So what happens if I shoot getting ready? All at one eight thousandth of a second and have to entirely rely on lighting, and nothing else exists. And so those are periods, because it's just somebody putting on makeup in the end, it's not so meaningful, it's not moment filled. Um, and I say, like, I can push myself. I can, I can, this makes life more interesting for me. It makes me do something that maybe I hadn't done before. Maybe I learned something along the way. And so the problem with autonomy is that you can really crash and burn as well, right? Because you're in charge of your own destiny, and that means you can steer your destiny right into an iceberg. And so when we're starting our day, when we're starting our, you know, our projects, the worst thing that we can do is just look at our entire to-do list, which as photographers is massive is anyone in charge of their own business, in charge of their own life, is massive. When you look at all the things you could possibly do, that massive to-do list will sink you. What you want to do is say, how can I break this up into tiny little tasks? How can I break this up into something that's easy that then will allow me to do something that's awesome? Create the conditions where awesomeness occurs. So, for example, a simple example, just working out, if you say to yourself, you know what, I'm going to work out every day for the rest of my life. That's my goal. <laughs> You're going to fail. That's a huge goal. The rest of your life is a huge amount of time. If you say, tomorrow, I'm going to put on my gym clothes, and that's my goal. That's an easier goal. You can do that. I believe that you can put on your gym clothes. And then, because then it puts you in a situation where either you have to put off your gym clothes and you didn't go to the gym, or you're like, okay, uh, i got to go to the gym. But your only real goal was to just put on your clothes. Right? So that's just a small example of how do we create conditions where everything else cascades for us. And again, this was a revelation to me. Waking up early. It took me, I only started this last year. And I am the worst. You say like, oh, you know, again, if anyone thinks that these things were easy for me, I am a natural night owl. My natural bedtime in college was 5 a.m. Sunrise is the things that happens at the end of the day. The only thing that was on TV then was like Cartoon Network and C-SPAN, so I knew 
the, the, all of the U.S. senators by their voice because that was my life. And now, I wake up 5, 5.30. And as Tina Fey says, here's the thing about 5.30. Five hours later, it's 10.30. And again, this is something that other photographers don't do. And I know waking up early sucks. Because I wake up next to this woman every day. I don't want to get out of bed. It's the last thing that I want to do, especially as a night owl. But I think it's really important. It's revolutionized a lot of things for me. Because first of all, has anyone here ever been working on photos after midnight? Has anyone here not? Right? Like we certainly, we know this. 1, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. I mean, I've gone years forgetting what the sun looks like. And more importantly, then you start to forget what your friends look like, the ones that weren't wedding photographers, your family, the ones that weren't wedding photographers. We are on the opposite schedule of the rest of humanity. And so this is a way to join them, is when you start saying, I'm gonna front load things, I can get to the end of my day and say, I'm gonna go to sleep, I'm gonna rest, because I still have all these hours before the rest of the world, and especially the rest of the photography world, is going crazy, I can enjoy myself now. Maybe I can meet other people. Maybe I can see my family. And it just shifts everything forward. It starts off your day right, and it gives you actual rest that you feel OK taking. Because you get to the end of the day, I get here, and like, oh, I've been up for 14 hours. Uh, you know, I haven't been productive for all of them, and that's fine. I've been productive for enough of them. After this, I can take a break. When I was on my normal schedule, there was never a feeling that I could ever take a break. And that kills you. If you always, because we always have something we should be doing. So you've got to get through it and say, OK, I'm good now. Today's fine. Also, a special tip for New York, why waking up early is great for New York. This took me my entire career to learn. Sunrise shoots are amazing in New York. Because, you may have noticed, New York City has a lot of people. And we want to shoot everything at sunset, golden hour. And everyone is around us at golden hour. Everyone is uh, you know, walking and love to be in our photos. Sunrise, Central Park, High Line, all these, Brooklyn Bridge, all these places that are terrible to deal with people, they're not there. So sunrise shoots are amazing. Also, a little secret just for the freelancers out there, the best part of what we do is you can take a nap. You wake up early in the morning, get some work done, and you're like, wow, I wish I didn't wake up so early. I'm tired. Take a nap. Rest is a weapon. Rest is, you know, will get you through everything else. But that's one of the ma amazing things is that not only, like, we can not only work hard and play hard, but we can rest hard. By not being in an office, if I'm not working, I can really not be working. And that's valuable. I don't have to just sit there and kind of pretend I'm working and, and you know, just stare at my screen, which isn't recharging me. I can watch a movie. I can take a nap. So get stuff done early. Get a wind under your belt. It's just a tip. Give it a try. I tried it, and it was amazing. So here's a, a few quick tips. Um, if you want to try this, if you want to go from night owl to daytime, and again, I was the worst, just give yourself a few okay, a few days where it's okay to be really tired, because you will be. Set up multiple alarms, preferably in different rooms. I actually had to start setting up an alarm basically in my shower, right? So the alarm went off, and I was like, oh, and by the time it went off, I would just turn the shower on, and that was when I was finally awake. And the, the first thing is you want to really hit that first task. Whatever like, is hardest that day, just get it done, get it out of your way, and then you feel awesome for the rest of your day. So, and this isn't about, like, you have to be awesome and amazing and do 10 times more work than you do now, and that's the way to be happier. It's not going to make you happier. What this is about is you can wake up, you can have some time to yourself, you can enjoy the day, and then when you get to that period, which we all have, they're like, oh my god, I've been goofing off. It's time to get to work. Now I hit that period about 7 a.m. <laughs> like, oh my god, I'm so late. Oh no, it's 7. It's 8. 
great. And of course, to, shut, to get your schedule back on track, it's helpful to also have a go to sleep alarm, which I actually have for myself right here. Simple tips, simple things, but you'd be amazed when you start saying, when people say, oh, it's six o'clock, uh, can you do something? Yeah, I can, because I've been doing all my crazy work already. And kids know this. Kids do things right. The world is wrong. Some of you, if anyone's a runner here, knows that like, the perfect runner is a seven-year-old girl. She has perfect form. Uh, I've learned from my trainer, kids will also do like, a perfect deadlift. Kids will also like, lift weights in perfect ways, even though they're not lifting a lot. We just teach ourselves the wrong way to do things. And kids, they love to get up early because like, life is exciting. So we want to say, like, how can we have that feeling? How can we have the feeling that maybe our days are exciting? Because they should be. So here's how we can divvy up the day quickly and just learn like, to make your life more productive. Again, not to be the most productive person, but to be more productive than the guy sitting next to you. Be more productive than other photographers. So here are a few apps that I use very quickly. You can just take a photo of the screen. Um, the most important thing for me is to get rid of the internet when I don't want to be using it. And so there are a couple apps. Freedom and Rescue Time will both just freeze your internet access. Warning, many photographer, tax, uh, photographer tasks actually require the internet. I have sometimes turned this on for an hour and said, great, now I can get to work. What's my work? Upload a wedding. Doesn't work so well. But when you feel yourself that drag of, oh god, I wanted to work and I got stuck on the internet, where did the day go? Freedom is first. And rescue time will not only freeze the internet for you, but if you goofed off, it'll tell you later. It'll say, hey, this is what you did today. And was it productive or not? And there's an app called 3030, which I'm actually using right now to, to time the talk. Uh, it just times you in different tasks, which is how I know what the actual schedule is, even though we're off schedule. Um, it just times you in different tasks. And that way you can say, I'm going to work for a little bit of time, and I'm going to rest for this much time. And so you know that you have rest coming. Because we can't just say, again, make those big goals. What are you going to do today? I'm going to work all day. You'll fail at that goal. But if you say, I'm going to work for half an hour, then I'll rest for 10 minutes. I'll do something. I'll then I'll read my stories. Then I'll start working again. 30-30 is, is a good app for actually making that work for you. Uh, AnyDo is a great to-do to list for me. But this is all the little stuff. The thing that is most important for me, the thing that makes me more productive than anything in terms of apps, in terms of computers, is actually Google Hangouts. And all I do with it is just call up a bunch of my friends who are also wedding photographers, and we work together. So there can be 10 of us online, on screen together, and no one is talking for like half an hour, because we're working together. And like, why does that make you more productive? Well, this is what I've learned, is that we also require connection, right? So one of the loneliest times that I ever had in my life was when I first became a full-time photographer, and I was so excited. I mean, how many people have done this? I mean, I've seen so many people like, yes, I just lost my job. No, I'm a full-time photographer. Yeah. Or like, I'm headed out on my own. And oh man, I was, I was ready to go. I would already had all these weddings under my belt. And then I spent 48 hours in my apartment and didn't leave, because I worked in my apartment. And I slept in my apartment. And I read in my apartment. And <clears throat> that's a problem. It's lonely. So this is just a way to create an office for yourself. Say, hey, hey guys, here's what I'm doing. What are you doing? And then just work. I triple my productivity whenever I'm using it. Um, and then you can print out uh, schedules for yourself. It's very, uh, very easy. There's, a, there's actually a book called The Productive Person. It's a $3 book. And it has schedules for you to just say, this is easy. And it might be, like there are schedules where like you work six hours that day. This isn't about how do I work more, it's about how do I work smarter than the other photographers around me. The worst thing you can have is notifications. Why was the first thing that I got rid of out of my life email? Because for people, email is a full-time job. And the more you do it, it's like quicksand. 
you, you send something and the replies come back, the replies come back. The more you do it, the, the, the more it just eats up anything else you were doing. And if you do it throughout the day, all your other tasks are meaningless because you keep taking yourself out of it, keep responding, which you kind of have to do. So I said, I have to break free from this, but at the very least, if you, if you have to respond, you need to set times for yourself to do these things and otherwise turn off everything else. Turn off all your notifications, email, especially Facebook. Like, Facebook is not your friend. Notifications are the devil. So, mastery. Again, this propels us forward. We're photographers because we want to get better at stuff. And photographers kind of have that personality. So you want to work a lot. Photographers tend to love this book, um, Outliers, by Malcolm Gladwell. Probably a lot of people here have read it or e at least know about it. And so one of the main things, sort of the main things that people draw from it is they did this study of violinists, something that's very craft-based, very skill-based. And they said, we want to see if there are any people out there who are just amazing violinists just naturally. And if there are any people there who have worked hard their entire lives and are just terrible violinists. And they found no one. They found no one who had only practiced a little bit but was amazing, and no one that had put in the time and the hard work and the effort and was terrible. They found that everyone that was amazing had put in more work than everyone that was kind of okay, and everyone that was kind of okay had put in more work than everyone that was terrible. So there was no cheat. And what we, the, the, what we get from this is, you know, they kind of say, 10,000 hours to be an expert, right? And so that's why I shoot a lot. I go to a lot of weddings because I want to get in my 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours is a long time. I want to get it at photography. I want to get it at weddings. So work a lot. And work makes you better if you work smart. Don't be a treadmill. Don't be doing the same thing. We all know people who've maybe done three times as many weddings as I have, and they're still shooting the same way they did 20 years ago. I always want to push the envelope. I always want to go a little bit beyond. Because you know, I want to have the freedom sometimes to suck. I want to, if I'm beyond my envelope, I will sometimes take photos that are terrible. If you, are, if you come back from a shoot and all of your photos are pretty good, you weren't working hard enough. If you don't have any terrible photos, you were very, very safe in your comfort zone. So, now we work in weddings. Sometimes it's good to be safe. You don't want to come up to people and say, hey man, I was trying this new technique, it would have been really cool, but it didn't quite work. We don't have any photos of your ceremony. <laughs> you want to, but the weddings are long days. I mean, my average day is like 12, 13 hours. There are lots of spaces where you can carve out time to maybe suck. You know, again, getting ready is mostly just people sitting in a chair putting on makeup for hours. Try new stuff. There's lots of hours of dancing and dancing and dancing. Try more. If you're, even if you're hourly, maybe it's like, oh, I'll stay a little bit extra time just to goof around, just to do things that might be awesome or might be terrible. Um, and because that's when you have space to do it. And sometimes I'll, if I have a second shooter that I'll trust, I'll say, hey, you, be normal. I'm going to do something really weird, even with an important moment, because I know that they've got it. And so sometimes I miss it, but then sometimes I really get it. So don't be a, dread, a treadmill. Don't just do the same thing over and over. So, Speaking of working hard, yeah. okay. <laughs> you're working hard. So uh, we have a question Great. on Twitter, and then we've got we to wrap you up a little bit. Okay. But, uh, so the question is from Tyler Zoller at Ryan Bernizer. Is it difficult to continue making each wedding unique and individual when you do 50 plus weddings a year? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you are thinking of weddings as just more of the same. If you think of it as white dress, white dress, kiss, ring, something simple like that, then, and you put it in these, these little categories, then it's going to feel the same, and your work is going to feel the same. For me, it's all about the people, and people are always different. Again, we can do weddings, we can do 30 weddings right here, and if you're focused on the people and the way that they relate to each other, and not just the couple, but also, you know, everyone who's there, everyone who they care enough about to have the wedding here and to do all this work for them, they're going to be different. The whole feeling is going to be different. And so 
I also, you know, you work so hard to, to have some things in your back pocket to say, you know, how can I be creative in different ways? I am mostly creative through my gear by breaking a lot of stuff. And whenever I break something, I don't replace it with the same thing. So I kind of cycle through everything. It's my, my gear bag is kind of like the Millennium Falcon. Like, n nothing is all working at the same time. And so I've, I've, I've always got new things. And for me, a, a new lens or something is just like a new pair of eyes. I put on an 85, I see like an 85. I see the depth, I see the, the isolation. I put on you know, a 35, I see like a 35. I see some of the storytelling. And, and so just working through that, finding whatever it is that kind of gets you going, gets you doing something different, um, will we'll, we'll push you onward. The last thing that keeps us going, when you're having the worst day of your life, the thing that makes you take the next step is purpose. And again, this is something that is a lot easier to do in wedding photography than if you're an accountant. We have purpose. Purpose is the feeling that you're working as part of something larger than yourself. And so again, if you're just chasing after likes, you're just chasing after like, oh, I really want something to be successful on Facebook, and those tough days, you're gonna say, well, I can do that tomorrow. But what you do on those days is what's gonna separate you, is what's gonna make you different. So if you say, yeah, today is terrible for things that are going on with myself, for things that are going on with this, <laughs> with this wedding, this shooting from me, it's all terrible, but you know what? This means something. So I have to push beyond. I used to, I used to publish every wedding. And I, you know, I ran out of time, but I still show every wedding to potential clients because I say to myself, there's no excuse. Every wedding is a portfolio wedding. Because I can't say that nobody says, well, we didn't really like our wedding photos, but it's OK, because he's taken a lot of great photos for other people. That'll, your clients will never say that, so you can never think that way, because everything matters. And that's why I get my inspiration from Chubbawamba, tub thumping. The truth is, I thought it mattered. I thought that music mattered. But does it? Bollocks. Not compared to how people matter. I spent a lot of time thinking that photography mattered. That the stuff, the F stuff, all this stuff mattered. Well, you want to get it behind you? What matters is the people. And so wedding photography has been cool somehow which is strange to me, because it was a red-headed stepchild when I started. And now it's kind of cool. And that's kind of weird to me. Because it's not about coolness. It's not about going after yourself, because that ends at a certain point. That only takes you so far. It won't take you to the worst days. <laughs> what will take you through is knowing that the stuff we tell our clients, it's real. It's true. Wedding photography actually matters. And the things that you do, the stories that you tell about people, if you're doing it right, I mean, we're taking photos that are going to end up on people's coffins. So I started this lecture telling you about one of my male role models, my grandfather. Um, this is a photo of the other, my father. And this is a terrible photo. I mean, it's you know, probably an uh, you know, instant camera, which is like you know, F11 automatically, and they still manage to get it out of focus, right? You know, the, the, the framing is all off. There's like a bottle of Tide and a laundry bag. It's like randomly green. It's terrible. But if you tried to take the only copy of this photo from me, like, I would fight you. And you probably have photos like that, too. Photos, if I was standing up here, and said, I've got this photo, it's the only one, I'm going to tear it up, you'd probably punch me in the face. Because that photo, that image is so important to you. And a lot of those photos, they may not have been the best photo. You may not be looking at it and thinking, oh, the bokeh, you know, oh, the brown eyes method, oh, you know, the technique that you use. You're thinking about the person in it, the way they make you feel. You're thinking about the moment. You're thinking about the meaning that it has to you. And so my father, did a couple important things to me to get me, a, uh, to get me on the road to being a photographer that I am. And the first was he loved collecting cameras. He loved B&H. B&H was his mecca. He would, he, we could never go within like 40 miles of New York City without going to B&H. So he, he loved collecting cameras. 
But the thing that really shaped me was he died. When I was eight years old, he, I, I found his body. And so what I have of him is photos. And so what drives me on is knowing that this stuff really matters. We are making connections. We are making people's history. We are documenting that. We are documenting the making of families. And on your worst day, if you don't think about the dress, if you don't think about the ring, if you don't think about uh, another wedding, if you think about that, the meaning that you are so lucky to be a part of, you'll be able to take that next step. You'll feel honored, and you'll be able to go beyond the person sitting next to you if they're still thinking about the dress. So guys, thank you so much. Thank you, BNH. Thank you.